Morning, church family. Uh, good to be back. I, uh, yeah, I know, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I was just gonna, gonna say that myself. Thank you, Linda. I missed everyone. It's good to be back. I, um, uh, was down at Beaver Community Church last, uh, Sunday just to, to serve them. Uh, Pastor Matt Oswell was out of town. I think he was in Montana uh, doing some ministry-related things, and so I had the opportunity to serve there. Uh, but uh, I missed everyone here. This is, this is the, the church body that I'm grafted into, so this is where I belong. So uh, anyway, just had to say that. Um, so we spent the last five weeks in Genesis chapter 19. I was just talking with uh, Todd about that this morning, that, you know, when the elders sit down and kind of go over what book uh, we're, that we're going to go through, we're seeking God's guidance and wisdom, and, uh, and then we uh, establish what book we're going to go through, and then we kind of, you know, roughly kind of outline the book, just roughly, just as far as kind of, you know, how, what's the pace we're going to get through this, and, and, and often the Lord has other plans. So we make plans, but we hold them loosely. And we initially thought, eh, we'll be in maybe chapter 19 a couple of weeks, and that was naive on my part. So we ended up being five weeks in chapter 19, simply because there's just so much in the text of Scripture, uh, so much that it would say to us how uh, incredibly relevant and applicable that this book is, especially that chapter for the time in which God has appointed for us to live in. So we're finally, after five weeks, moving into uh, chapter 20. So... uh, Lord willing, we'll get maybe seven verses into chapter 20 this morning. So um, anyway, let's, uh, before we look at the text of scripture, let's, let's pray and uh, let's spend some time in silent prayer and then I will close this out and then we'll look at the text. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of being called your children, that yes, you are indeed God. Lord, thank you for your word that speaks with great power, great authority into our hearts even. For Lord, who is there that can speak to the heart of man? Who is there, Lord, that can speak even to the very inner being of your children, but you and you alone? Lord, might you be magnified this morning as we humble ourselves and place us under your word. Lord, might you be exalted Might who you are be be consistent with how we see you? Often, Lord, your greatness is not seen by the blindness of people. So, Lord, speak to us this morning. Be our teacher. We ask that you would be highly exalted. We ask that your son, in whom you are well pleased, that you love perfectly within the Godhead, be highly exalted among us this morning. 
May your Holy Spirit be our teacher to train our hearts to live lives of worship before you. Help us, we ask, in the blessed name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Genesis 20, 1 to 7. I'm going to ask that you would stand for the reading of God's word, please. Genesis 20, 1 to 7. Here we go. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of his wife, said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he himself say, did not he himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. The word of the living God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So, over the last couple of weeks, Todd took us through a more focused study on the end of chapter 19. We saw the destruction of the cities of the valley. Of course, we saw that leading into the debauchery between Lot and his daughters. And this portion of the narrative was an intentional parenthesis to give us the origins of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Notice God is in control of all of this, even factoring in human sin. And, as Todd mentioned, this will be the last that we hear about Lot. Here in the book of Genesis, he is not mentioned again. The narrative goes silent regarding him. No mention of his death. Nothing. It intentionally stops. And the narrative ends in a moral low note, we could say. Lot's wife being turned to a pillar of salt as she looked back. Lot still desiring to live among a city in the valley where there are full of wicked people. He then, of course, wants to go there instead of the mountains, but then he goes to the mountains out of fear. Lot then engages in drunkenness and incest with his daughters. Yet, the New Testament refers to him as righteous Lot. Seems almost scandalous to put those two words together, does it not? And, but you know, we, we, we sing it at times that the grace of God is amazing. But beloved, let's learn from Lot's example. Just because you can do evil things and be considered righteous in God's sight, you still must deal with the consequences of those decisions. We've noted that often. Lot was considered righteous because that declaration of righteousness was faith in the righteous God, not his own righteousness. That that very idea is central. It is the core of the gospel itself. That your righteousness, as declared by God, is not a righteousness that comes from you. A perfect righteousness must come from someone else. I've asked people before, 
if you need like a segue to communicate the gospel to people, like, have you ever heard the gospel? And sometimes you'll hear an answer that's like, oh, sure, yes, I know that I've heard of the gospel. That's, I, I, I live a good life and then God brings me into heaven. And that's an unfortunate answer because if that's the case, what do we do with Lot who did not live a good life? He did many wicked things. Uh, how many people were here when we went through um, uh, Romans, in the series of Romans? Show of hands. Yeah, about half, three quarters of us, right? There's a phrase in that book that is wonderfully encouraging to all of us. And you know what it is? That it is God who justifies the ungodly. Thank you, Lord. Look at Lot. I mean, there's so many examples from Scripture that we can go to and see this, that God justifies the ungodly. Because if you think about it, you're like, I've done stuff. Everybody has done stuff. Well, if you haven't done stuff, you've thought stuff. You've desired stuff that is evil in God's sight. What do I do with that? I need a righteousness that's not just pretty good. I need perfect, because that's, by the way, what God sets forth to enter into his heaven is perfect. Perfect. Enter Jesus, the perfect man, right? Well, on the other hand, when you think about it, we're like, you know, I have done stuff and, and I know that he stands in my place. He represents God before me. But what about this debt I've racked up? Like a holy God can't just go, nah, don't worry about it. Enter Jesus again through the cross. He pays the debt that we've racked up before a holy God. And you're like, but you know what? There was like 300 and some thousand crucifixions. How do we know that one's efficacious for my sin? Because he was raised from the dead. See, this is not only theological, if you think about it, it's actually logical. This is not illogical that Jesus is the righteousness we need. Now, of course, Lot didn't know him by name but he had faith in the righteous God who sent Jesus. And the same is true for us. Lot was looking forward, you and I are looking back. But again, Lot was not exempt from the consequences of those decisions. Even though he was saved, the New Testament without question presents him as a saved man. So this morning, the narrative shifts from Lot and his daughters, back to Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Chapter 20, verse 1 begins with the words, from there. See that? Which begs the question. We don't want to ignore the, the, the geographical context. Where is there? Well, let's do a little Bible study, shall we? Look back at chapter 19, verse 27. I'll read it. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Okay, so let's stop. This place is a, is a vantage point. It's a it's a higher area up on a ridge. It's a vantage point from which he could view the destruction of the valley. But again, this place is described as where he had stood before the Lord. Begs another question. Well, where did he stand before the Lord? Well, look back at chapter 18, verse 22. Flip back another chapter. 1822, I'll read it. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still, still stood before the Lord. Okay. So we're getting a little bit closer to our answer, but we still don't have it yet. Same chapter, look back at verse 1, chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by, there it is, the oaks of Mamre, as he sat by the door of his tent in the heat of the day. So there we have our answer, the oaks of Mamre. So where's that? Well, this is an area located 
it's, in, it's outside of Hebron. Hebron's about 17 miles south of Jerusalem and you know, slightly west. And if you're looking at a map of the Middle East, which most people probably in the room here are familiar with the geography of the Middle East, there's a mountain range that is just east of Hebron. So Abraham would have been standing on the summit or on the ridge of this mountain range, looking east and slightly south into this valley region. Be like looking toward the south edge of the Dead Sea. And he's looking at these smoldering cities. And it is from there that Abraham moves on. And where does he head to? There's an interesting parallel in the text. Let me explain. So he goes back into the Negev, it says. Now, this is this desert region. It's about 4,500 square miles. We've talked about it before that Abraham has been at back in chapter 12. And verse 1 tells us that he sojourns, more specifically, around Gerar. Now, Gerar, if you know where, let's say, if you know where Gaza is, uh, it's actually southeast of Gaza. So Abraham then moves from this ridge, this mountainous area, southwest, away from the destruction that he just witnessed. Now, the problem with him moving into this area is this is occupied territory. There's already a kingdom there. And their king is named Abimelech. Now, the word, the name Abimelech is a, is a common name. So, uh, the, for example, we just heard Psalm 34. That's a different Abimelech. There's more than one in the Bible. But the Abimelech here in Genesis, we will talk about more here in just a moment. So as I noted just a moment ago, Lot and uh, the fact that righteous people still continue to sin at times. Let me give us a bit of wisdom for us to glean on this from Scripture. If you could summarize many of the righteous people of the Bible, it's this, old habits die hard. And you know what else? Old sins die even harder. Maybe jot that down. Old habits die hard. Old sins die even harder. Notice verse 2 again. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So many of you are probably thinking, hmm, this sounds vaguely familiar, which you would be correct. Here we go again. It's been possibly a few decades here in the narrative that back at the end of chapter 12, yes, Abraham did this exact same thing, only it was down in Egypt. Think about everything that's happened with the war with the kings and Melchizedek and everything that has taken place. God's faithfulness. You think Abraham would have moved beyond this type of behavior. No. Here in Genesis 20, Abraham goes through the Negev, just like before. He encountered a foreign ruler, just like before. He engages in deception, just like before. And he tells him, Sarah, my wife, is my sister, just like before. And just like Pharaoh, down in Egypt, Abimelech then takes Sarah into his harem. So, a couple things about that. First, as we've all already noted, old sins die hard. The Bible has a word for this, by the way. It's called iniquity. Anybody familiar with that term, iniquity? It's one of those Christian words that, you know, Bible translations will use. It means a pattern of sin, simply what it is. Everybody has them, by the way. It's not just, you know, uh, like brand new Christians or just that Christian or this Christian or this person in the Bible, everybody has them. So if you say, well, I don't think I have any iniquities, well, then your iniquity is pride or blindness or, you know, your iniquity is thinking too highly of yourself because everybody has those. 
Yes, some iniquities are patterned, learned through parental and cultural influences, but these still are willful patterns that are birthed out of a sin nature, which we're all born with. Back to Romans, it speaks clearly on the nature of man, born with a sin nature. We all need Jesus. And yes, this iniquity, these patterns of sins will be blunted or stunted as we grow and mature in Christ, but they will not completely go away until this sinful flesh that we're dwelling in now is sown in corruption. In other words, when you die, when I die and go to be with the Lord, we will deal with these struggles. Do you see how this is relevant for the Christian life? To be aware of your iniquities. So two cautions on that regarding iniquities. Do not condemn yourself for something Jesus died for and forgave you of. Okay, there's two ditches here. That's one of them. Don't condemn yourself for what Jesus forgave, forgave you of. Don't smother yourself in guilt or, you know, the, the self-flagellation, you know, beating your back. That's, a, that's, a sub, that's an attempted substitute for what Christ did. Don't do that. He forgave you of that. He freed you of that. Second, don't make excuses for it either. That's the other ditch. Don't make excuses for iniquities. Yield to the Holy Spirit who is in you, and he will kill it. It won't altogether go away until we die to be with the Lord, but yield to the Spirit. You see, these iniquities I find in myself, that's why to have close-knit Christian community is so beneficial in your Christian life, so beneficial for your sanctification in the Lord, because these iniquities are often blind spots. So let's, let's get practical. These are often blind spots, and we don't want to see them, right? It's like you're driving your car, you got the spot mirror, you know, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. You, like, kind of pry that off to make sure the sticky, the sticky back on the mirror, you're like, Meh, get that off there. I don't want to see that blind spot. That's how, often how we do. And then a, a loving brother or sister comes along and says, hey, you know, I see that. And you're like, see what? Beloved. These iniquities are often blind spots, so when a brother or sister comes alongside to make you aware of something, we are often shocked, or we don't want to hear it because, after all, they're blind spots. Yield to the Holy Spirit as he works in you. To, and he works for your fellow Christians, by the way, to not ignore them, but not beat yourself up for them either. So yes, these iniqui iniquities are present within all of us. We just don't submit to them. So, old sins die hard. Consider Abraham here. The quintessential man of faith set forth in the New Testament had them. How much more will we? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and maybe perhaps some of you have been doing the math and following along carefully through this series in Genesis. You're probably wondering, what in the world is Abimelech doing going after a 90-year-old woman? Does that not cross your mind? All I can say is, Sarah must have been quite a knockout. Or she's aging much better than most of us. But either way, we, that's you know, speculation. What, either way, whatever Abimelech's motive was, what took place is what took place. And Abraham and Sarah, they fall right back into that old pattern. And there's a lesson in there for us that when certain circumstances present themselves, you will default to wherever you're at, maturity-wise. So the key is to grow in the Lord because you will always fall back on what, what is often a blind spot in your life. And we see that with them. Do you see why this, this text serves as a caution for those of us in our walk of faith? So let me ask. 
what old sinful habits are you refusing to let go of? That, that's the question for us. If a brother or sister has ever mentioned something to you about, I mean, people come to me, I'm sure many of you, people have came to you, what have they mentioned that you just refuse to listen? That's the beauty of the body of Christ. To not beat yourself up for them, but yet to expose things so that we can grow and mature. So what sinful habits are you refusing to let go of? So back to the narrative. Sarah is taken into Abimelech's court. This creates an issue with the promises of God. We'll get to that here in just a moment. And God, of course, moves in to deal with this. Look at verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman you have taken, for she is a, is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hand, I have done this. So he appears to have cleared his name before God. So God, he comes to Abimelech in a dream. And, and maybe just kind of on the side here for just a moment. I wouldn't say arguing from the text of scripture, from the canon, all 66 books, that this is something that God does a lot. I wouldn't say that it's common, yet it is recorded in, a, in numerous places in the Bible. God coming in a dream or communicating through dreams. Uh, for example, you have Laban later in the book of Genesis who experiences a dream. Uh, further on in the book of Genesis, you have the cupbearer and the baker from Pharaoh's court, if you remember when they were imprisoned. And of course, Pharaoh himself eventually has a dream and Daniel, or excuse me, Joseph comes in uh, interprets the dream. Then you have Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. It's getting ahead of myself there. And he has a dream and it is interpreted. So, you know, God does do this occasionally. So he comes to Abimelech in a dream and he tells him, you're a dead man for taking this woman. <laughs> what a terrifying greeting from God himself, Right? He comes to you in a dream. You are a dead man. So why does God do this? Well, I talked about the promise of God to Abraham earlier. Remember, that's a theme through the book of Genesis, is the promises of God. Of course, this is the book of beginnings. So we only get these wonderful promises, and these prophecies are really set forth in embryonic states, the first book of the Bible. But they find their culmination in Jesus Christ. So why does God intervene here? Well, to protect the promise that he gave to Abraham. Isaac, if you remember, is the promised son, and he's gonna come in the very next chapter, chapter 21. And he must, this, this, this promise that God has given Abraham must come through Abraham and Sarah. Do you remember the promise given? About this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a child. He says that to the dad, Abraham. So the recipients of the promise here from God in order to fulfill his word has to be to Abraham and Sarah, not Abimelech and Sarah. Do you see the issue? So why does that matter to us? Well, one, the promises find their culmination in Jesus Christ, which we as Christians have faith in. But secondly, God is able to fulfill his promises even when we do stupid stuff. And that is good news for us. Or even if an unbeliever tries to step in and interfere, God is able to fulfill his promises. Do you see why this matters to us? Now, perhaps, think about this in our modern context, right? I mean, I think I heard a statistic here a couple years ago like that, Divorce has actually gone down slightly. I don't know if that's still the case. You know why? Because people stopped getting married. 
well, it stopped getting married, but there's less marriages, right? People are just kind of shacking up together, right? So you don't have divorces when people don't ever get married. It is kind of move in and move out, move in and move out. Well, perhaps all of this adultery and immorality would be put off in our day if people heard from God, behold, you're a dead man. But in many ways, people have heard that over and over from the word of God itself, and yet people refuse. People don't heed the warning. They refuse. And and by the way, if people don't yield to that and repent, that, that little, you're a dead man, that's not a threat. That's a promise that, that God will deliver. He, he'll fulfill that. So now, Abimelech's response is really interesting, if you think about it. It's an interesting response because he seems to know just exactly who he's talking to. And at the end of verse four, he says, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? implication that this absolute monarch's sin would affect the entire realm. Now remember, they might all be innocent of adultery, but they're not innocent in the truest sense of the word. And so Abimelech here begins to plead his case. Me and my people have done no wrong, Lord. And he continues in verse five, did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. Then he says, in the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Now, that answer, I guess if you get technical, seems to have a measure of truth to it. But his answer really reveals the unrighteousness of Abimelech, the fact that he would actually attempt to plead his his own righteousness before a holy God. We as Christians are like, I wouldn't even go there. Yet, that is what this king does. Now, given what the word of God says about the holiness of God and the heart of man, his answer is extremely lacking, and it reflects really a theological adolescence. Still a problem today, by the way. However, it appears that Abimelech is indeed innocent. He appears to be innocent of any wrongdoing regarding Sarah, but pay careful attention. Some of you probably, maybe most of you, picked up on God's response. Pay pay careful attention to verse 6. Look what God says to Abimelech. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, if you think about the implications of that, that may actually be upsetting. Which I wouldn't argue is altogether a bad thing, because that means you're getting the implications of this verse. He did not let him touch her. Now, because in the, in the ultimate sense here, Abimelech's will to do something isn't free. In the ultimate sense. God blocked him. He did not get a choice. Furthermore, he wasn't even aware of it. Now, sure, what am I saying? What am I not saying? Our experience of things does indeed give us a measure of freedom. And we, of course, are responsible for every choice we make. But we are not so free as to ever thwart the plans of the living God. Those two realities live well together. Furthermore, Abimelech, as I noted a second ago, was not even aware that this was the case until God told him. Same with us. You know, we, we, maybe we think we are 
absolutely autonomous as free creatures until you come into Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 to 7, and go, and, whoa, and you're met with this reality. On top of that, there's no indication in the text that Abimelech was even a saved man. And you might say, well, he's talking with God. You know, you got to believe in someone to talk to them. Well, yes, I mean, in that sense, yes. But the, in the salvific sense, no. Where do I get that? From the Bible, right? Look back, think back to chapter 4 of Genesis. Remember Cain and Abel? Cain having a pretty long conversation with God. Well, how's it end up? He leaves the presence of the Lord, never hear anything from him again. And then the New Testament presents him as this lost person who, who was talking with God. Or what about Balaam in the book of Numbers? Remember him? He talked to God a lot, and yet he is this example that the New Testament puts forth as a deceiver, as a, as a lost person, and yet he talks with God over and over again. You know, the, as a new believer, when I first was... When I first encountered Balaam, and I was met with this character in the Old Testament, he messed with me a little bit, you know? Because he's like talking with God and, you know, just casual conversation, and yet he's lost. Now, don't forget Satan and his minions, right? Occasionally, the text of Scripture will put forth that, that they talk with God, and yet there is, they're headed for an eternity in hell. So, what's going on? Well, what's happening here in the text? God here is pulling the curtain back. And he's allowing us to peer into the spiritual realm. That's what's happening here. And the most plain conclusion that we can draw is mankind is not absolutely autonomous. Only God is. And he exercises this authority over mankind, even over high governing officials, like kings here. You remember Proverbs 21.1 that says, the king's heart is, in, is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Now, some may not like this. This seems like an assault on your being. But beloved, God puts these texts, and by the way, many, many others, Old Testament, New Testament, he puts these here for us to correct some of our thinking. This shapes how you pray. You see why there's implications to this. It shapes how you pray, or maybe it shapes more fully your understanding of the God that you're praying to. This is how he works. Because, beloved, beliefs inform practices. Beliefs inform practices. Beliefs about the sovereignty of God informs us about how we conduct ourselves before him. And I understand that for perhaps at least some of you, this might be scrambling your eggs a little bit when you get met with these texts. But all I can say is, take that omelet to God. Like, he can, he can handle it. He, he, and he will shape and mold your thinking to think more in a line with who he is and how he works. Now, for Christians, like, let's narrow it a, a little more. Because he's dealing with this unbelieving king, right? Now, for Christians, let's narrow it here. God intervening and putting a stop to our sin that's just another Tuesday for God. This is how he works. Because he, he uses and works through his Holy Spirit's ministry to us to bring this about. Let me give you a text that just says it. Galatians 5, 17 tells us this very thing. Let me read it. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And we're all like, yeah, news, that's not a news flash, Right? The desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. 
for these are opposed to each other, look at the last phrase, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There it is, right there in the new covenant. The Holy Spirit restraining some of our sinful desires. And all I'm saying is, awesome, praise God. I had no idea that kind of freedom was even available until I came to Christ. So why do I still sin then, preacher? That question's there, granted. Well, short answer, your sin nature. The iniquities, still there, right? Do you see how this is liberating, forgiven, yet being sanctified? The Holy Spirit restraining some of this in my walk makes you pray different. But that whole concept is another sermon for another day. But God is at work in us to to change us and in some cases block some of our sinful desires. Praise God for that. So finally, look at verse seven. God is continuing to speak. Verse seven, now then, speaking to Abimelech, return the man's wife for he is a prophet so that He will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Okay, when I was meditating on this text, a question came to mind that probably has come to some of your minds. Why did God not give Abimelech a choice just a moment ago, but here he does, right? He he gives Abimelech a choice. You either do this or deal with the consequences. Well, why does he not get a choice and then he does get a choice? Here's the only answer I could come up with. I don't know. (laughs) He's God. It's his prerogative. He's not a machine that that says, I will do this and then I will do that. He's a person. So we can speculate as to why God might not give Abimelech a choice on one part and then yes on another, but you know what? We don't know. But what I can say, and I'm gonna be a little bit blunt here, we gotta deal with it. Like God doesn't set this forth like, well, if you want to believe that this is how I work, then you know I'll make a suggestion that you do that. No, we need to deal with it and draw near. Not deal with it or attempt to deal with it intellectually and then run away from him. We deal with it and draw near. This is why I say the text of scripture reads us. If it it doesn't, are we really reading it? We deal with it and we draw near. And so for the first time here in the narrative, if you noticed, Abraham is called a prophet. But that shouldn't shock anyone, because look at who God has made Abraham to be. And I'll kind of finish out with this here. Beloved, notice how God has chosen to work in and through the prayers of his people. This is mind-boggling. Notice the middle of verse verse 7 again. It says, God says, he will pray for you and you shall live. He's appointed the end and the means. Do you see that? He will pray for you. And then I will listen to what he is going to pray to me about and then you're going to live. See, this is the same thing in Job chapter 42. God had appointed to listen and work through the prayers of his people. For time's sake, let me just read it. Job 42, seven and eight. This is right at the end of the book. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. Then God says this, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer to deal with you, to to not deal with you according to your folly. I'll stop there. He's appointed to 
hear the prayers of his people and respond. How profound is that, beloved? If you think about who God is and who we are, and he listens to us and is appointed to work through our prayers. And isn't that amazing that the eternal creator, savior God of all the universe has decreed to listen to us and then respond? So, if you're not praying much, and I'm not saying you got to be some profound prayer warrior that can go three days without sleeping and you just pray, 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 pray. No, I don't, I don't, I think like 99.9% of Christians within the kingdom are not that. Some are, but most of us are not. But for us, if you're not praying much, it's because you don't believe this about God. I'll just say it. You don't believe You might know it, but you don't believe that God is appointed to listen to you and respond accordingly. Like a father to a child. So, I would say repent of that thinking. That's wrong thinking. And don't forget, by the way, that's kind of putting it negative. Let me say it positive. James 5.16. The effectual prayer of a righteous person avails much. Much. Yes. Why? Because, again, God is appointed to work through our prayers. This is how he has decided to act. He is our father, and we are his children through the relationship we have through Christ. So if you see prayer as a privilege, you're getting things right side up. Instead of saying, oh, I should probably go pray. See, just saying it like that's diagnostic. So, As his child, talk to him with this in mind. Do you see why this is so beneficial for us as the children of God? Talk to God with that in mind because that's what Abraham did. And we get the privilege of doing this too. Okay, I'm gonna stop. So uh, next week, we'll pick it back up in verse eight. Lord willing, maybe we'll get through all of chapter 20. So... uh, Please be praying as you are reading, and we will see kind of how this plays out with Abimelech. And I know many of you have read the book of Genesis numerous times, and you've been reading ahead because I talked to many of you. But we'll see how this plays out, and we can kind of prime our our minds to hear and and believe the word of God next week. So, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Will the praise team please come forward, and let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for how you so clearly and truly reveal yourself. Lord, we praise you that when your word starts to bump into our thinking that your Holy Spirit opens the mind changes the heart to where we lay down our weapons of rebellion and submit to you, knowing you have what is best for us. You you are good in all of your ways. Thank you, Lord, with your perfect omniscience, you always respond to us in what is best for us and what is most glorious to Christ So Lord, if you are restraining our sin, we praise you for it. Give us grace, Lord, to recognize it and grow in it. That we would be transformed by your ministry in us. Help us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.